I can continue with the questions from yesterday. I'm not sure I answered this one. What's the difference between mindfulness as a practice and mindfulness as a fruit of the practice? Did we talk about that? It's funny calling it a practice really, isn't it? Mindfulness, the next part of the question, is it possible to have mindfulness as the base? And I think that's more the point, that we have this ability to wake up, don't we? We can wake up and become more, and we say more aware of the of experience of what's what's happening directly. Like in the Satipatthana Sutta where it says um, you know, just in a very simple way you know when you're standing, you know when you're sitting. You kind of in a very, just enough. It's very interesting to play with that. How, how much do you have to be aware in order to know you're sitting, you know, how much, how, how does one know one's sitting or standing or lifting one's hand? How, how much, what kind of knowledge is that? How much conceptual knowledge is involved? Is it conceptual? Is it actually not conceptual, but somehow we do know? Which finger am I lifting? How do I know? Even with my eyes closed, I know which finger. It's kind of very simple knowledge. And it's interesting in the Satipatthana Sutra, it says knowledge and mindfulness. Diligence, knowledge and mindfulness. Mm -hmm. Diligence being the... It's the word in, in is virya, which is kind of like energy the kind of energy that you life energy that we have we can we can actually we can energize ourselves can't we mm. kind of energize ourselves and become we know and then we realize we know we know and then we can remember that we know and i was thinking particularly um if you, i'm thinking of I was very struck with him when I um, met him and was watching how he was. And he had this quality, this wonderful energy that was aware and knowing what was going on around him. I mean, I was putting him in the past tense. I mean, this is yeah, how he is. Uh, and an example was when he was speaking to us one time and we all were sitting in front of him with tape recorders and they all, when he stopped speaking, then he would, you know, we would all turn our recorders off. But sometimes one of us would forget to turn it off, so he would actually turn it off for us. <laughs> and then when, when he started speaking again, then we all turned them on again. And then if one of us forgot, then he would, <laughs> and he, he would do it as he was going to give to speak, he had the presence of mind to notice. So how was he noticing something like that? It's almost like he had such a sense of the whole situation and that something was missing, this hadn't been switched on. And it, it just kind of, he did it so naturally. We have completely gobsmacked. I was completely gobsmacked because I would be the person who was forgetting to turn it on and off. <laughs> <laughs> Or, or when he came to stay with us in Oxford one time, and you know how you sort of say, oh, where's my handbag? And, you know, then he'd say, oh, you left it by the table. <laughs> 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 he actually had watched, he'd actually taken in everything, every little detail like that. And I, you know, you think, well, how would you have to be to, for that to be coming easily? You'd have to be very awake in the... 
just very awake and and not focused on one thing, but taking in the whole situation as a whole. Sometimes Trungpa Rinpoche refers to this as a panoramic awareness, the sense that it's not like concentration, you come back to the same thing, you come back to the same thing, it's sort of narrowing. Whereas the, the sati is more, you know, narrowing in what? I suppose you'd say it's a bit like the A and the Vam, isn't it? The concentration is very Vam, but the sati is very A, very spacious. And we, we do have that. We do have that quality. And I wonder if it's... If you, if you think too much of it as a practice, you might actually get too focused, mightn't you? You might think, oh, I need to practice this. But, you know, I can't think of another word. It's just like becoming habituated to valuing the waking up quality. And because you you value it and you remember that it's useful and it's wonderful and it enhances your whole experience, it's the basis for the path, you find you do wake up more. You kind of... And, and in fact, you gain... You get... You, develop a sort of abhorrence or, or dislike for being dull. You, know, you recognise when you're being dull. So then, then you have to be careful that you're not rejecting dullness, mm. that you wake to dullness rather than rejecting dullness, which is quite interesting, isn't it? Mm. Oh, this is dullness. Mm. This is dullness. Right. My mind's just not engaging. This is dullness. So that's actually, that is waking in the dullness. It's quite interesting. Waking to the dullness. Waking to the... I'm not sure that's the question. Yes, is it possible to have mindfulness as the base? It is the base of the path. I mean, we heard in the the um, Satipatthana Sutta, that actually this quality, if it's a quality, is, um, is it a quality or a practice? Is the basis for the path. There's no path if you're not, if you're not exercising this waking up um, ability that we have. Becoming, I mean, we use different expressions, don't we? we? Become more aware, or we pay attention, or but we can do it, mm. <laughs> sort of. <laughs> and then, of course, ultimately, the fruit is we are awake. That's that's at the moment we are awake sometimes, or a bit more awake sometimes. And finally, we're awake. And at that point, in, in fact, there's the understanding that we realise what it is we've woken from and what we've woken into. It's like waking from a dream. You, you kind of realise what a dream is when you've woken up. You don't realise what the dream is until you've woken up to the fact it's a dream. And then you're awake. Well, you can be awake in a dream, can't mm. you? So it's kind of the same sort of thing, but at a, to the nth degree. <laughs> I hope that answers that. Does anyone want to ask anything further on that? Okay. Uh, equanimity awareness. Is there a relationship between awareness and not-self? Well, that's a big question, really, about self. And as I often say, Buddhism is famous for teaching on not-self. And you get this assumption that Buddhism teaches there is no self. But actually, the Buddha never taught there was no self. Um, he taught that what was impermanent and unsatisfactory 
was not self. And why? Because it was impermanent and unsatisfactory. And so that would imply self was not impermanent and unsatisfactory. <coughs> and I, it's, it's very interesting because I was talking to Dribbun Kempo about this. I mentioned this in my talk the other day. That um, in the English dictionary, self means what something truly is. You know, what is it in itself? Well, we're not what's impermanent and suffering. That's not what we are in ourself. So what are we in ourself? Well, maybe we're awareness. You know, maybe we're vidya. You know, or awareness is, as I said yesterday, it's not too obvious what we mean by awareness, but maybe that's what we are. We're not what we're attached to, which we grasp with our uh, grasping mind. Uh, this is this is me. This is the world. This is something I haven't got. This is something I need. This is something I've got to grasp. This is something I've got to keep away. This is me. So that all these kind of conceptual ideas of what we are, when you examine them, they don't make sense. They're not actually what we are. They're not really what we're experiencing. So then when you look at what you really are experiencing, you're not even experiencing impermanence. You know, like, I think I'm experiencing things as impermanent because they seem to come into existence, they stay a while and then they disappear. But then when I look even more carefully, I'm not even sure I do see them arise or I see them disappear. Or even that it's even possible that they could arise or disappear. In fact, any way I try to think of them with my grasping mind doesn't work. And yet, in the sati, I, can, I am aware of it. I know, I'm, I know I'm standing when I'm standing. I know I'm moving my hand when I'm moving my hand. But I cannot tell you anything about how I know that. I can't even say, you know, anything I conceptualize isn't it. So somehow it could be very simple, couldn't it? Knowing could be much simpler than, than I, th I thought it was. And that knowingness itself is not separate from what it's knowing. It's all of a piece. And that would be, you might want to call that vijja, you want to call, might call that awareness. And then that would be what was really what you were. That's what it, really what I am. And what I think I you know, what I'm grasping onto, which is conditioned, impermanent and unsatisfactory, is not self. It's not myself. <coughs> Something I'm making up. <coughs> A magical display mm -hmm. of apparent objects that are external to the mind, which can't possibly be external to the mind. It's a display, awareness, appearances, or you could say <coughs> empty appearances, or in the heart search of form is emptiness, emptiness is form. But that's truly the nature of reality, the nature of what I am. Um, what isn't what I am is what's conditioned, impermanent and unsatisfactory. I don't know if that helps. You're looking very mystified. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm saying it as if it's all quite terribly obvious. But in, fact, in fact, this is, you know, what we're trying to, this is our project, is to somehow gradually, gradually, some of this penny starts to drop and we realise the significance of this 
this um, yeah, the significance of not self and impermanence and emptiness. It dawns bit by bit. If we persist with diligence, with our sati. Yeah. How can we skillfully approach death when it actually happens? Well, that's how we're living our life, isn't it? Because it might happen any time, and so we never know. It is we never know how we're going to die, do we? So, if we're going to die, if we kind of know we're going to die in a few months, that's kind of a nice situation, really. Because then you have time to sharpen up. But you will have to, you know, you have to start straight away, really. That's why we start each day. Death comes with that warning, so get on with it, you know. You're preparing now. This fact, how you practice in your life is how you're going to, this is how you're preparing to die. It's not a separate practice, really. Nonetheless, it does sharpen us up, doesn't it? When we, we, you know, if we were new, we were going to die in a month or two. I think we would sharpen up. I think more than anything, what you need to connect to is what you have most confidence in. Something, something within your own experience that you have confidence in. And it's not... Okay, you might say, well, you're developing confidence in your own openness, clarity and sensitivity, and your Buddha nature, the indestructible heart essence. But the tendency is for that to be mine. You know, it tends to narrow down to me, and my openness, my clarity, my sensitivity. And then there's a sense of you know, impending death, you know, like, am I strong <coughs> enough? Do I have enough confidence in that? I think that's when you realise, oh, hang on. Openness, clarity, sensitivity are not qualities of mine. They're qualities of the true nature of reality. And that means this is what Buddhas have realised. This is what, you know, Milarepa has realised. This is the nature of reality, so therefore... They are that reality, and they are there, they are present. I can actually, yeah, I can actually pray. I think sometimes as Buddhists, because we've moved out of a theistic religion, we feel that prayer is something we've left behind. But in actual fact, it's essential that ability to sense other, you know, to sense Buddha nature in the other, and Buddha nature in, you could say, the universe, or the, the Buddhas who've already realized the true nature of reality, they don't go anywhere. They are accessible. We can open to them, and in a way, that allows them, that enables them to hold us. You know, this expression, hold us in your compassion. They can hold us, but we can fight. We can resist, we can ignore, we can dismiss things. So to the extent we're doing that, to that extent we're not going to feel the power of their holding us. So really, prayer is more about not resisting, not, not uh, fighting, not dismissing, but kind of just opening, even to the possibility that maybe the power of enlightenment is actually everywhere and reaching out to me and I'm just ignoring it. And it's not something separate and different from my own nature. It's not something foreign. It's... It's actually supporting me in what is most fundamental in me, in my being. So one could be very simple with that. One could simply, sometimes people say they, they have the sense of there's some kind of grace or some sort of 
power or they can just say, you know, just abide with me or some, some, something very simple like that. I think when that comes to dying and we're going through a lot of suffering perhaps, um, to have a kind of confidence both in our own essential nature and a kind of confidence in we are being held especially if we've taken refuge. Because when we take refuge, it's like our statement, our saying to the universe, okay, I'm putting my trust in you. I'm putting my trust in the Buddhas and the Dharma, the Sangha. This is, this is, yeah, I'm putting, I'm putting my trust in this. And trust is a very simple thing. It's like, okay, I'm not, I'm not fighting, I'm not resisting, I'm opening to this. I'm opening to this possibility of following this path and being supported by the Buddha Dharma Sangha in a very deep sense. So if you can have that kind of confidence and not worry about the fact that you can't concentrate or you can't, you know, you're, um, as I say, my, the day I die will probably not be one of my best days. <laughs> and I'm not very good on my days that I'm not on my best. <laughs> I think... Be ready for that, you know, not to think, oh, you know, I'm coming to die, now I've got to really do my best performance as I, as I, as I leave. Well, yeah, it'd be great, but the chances are it's not going to be like that. Mm. The chances are you'll be fighting for your life, mm. to be honest. Because mm. if you don't know you're going to be dying, you're going to be trying to just save your life, and so you're going to be preoccupied with how can I save my life, and then back, bop, you're gone. Because you didn't, you know, you couldn't say that. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so I think it's really important to think, okay, that's not the last chance. Because what happens, you die. And then it seems very reasonable to me that you then go unconscious. You know, you, you're unconscious for a time. And then you come round. And then you realise you've parted company with your body. <laughs> Which is really kind of alarming. But if you prepared yourself for that, you think, ah, so now's the time for me to, you know, now is the time to think what heart connections mean. You know, I can connect. I can have that com confidence. I can trust that I'm protected by the refuge. I'm protected by my own nature, really, and my trusting in, in that. I'm being held in the compassion of all the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas or the universe, or something, it doesn't really matter what you think it is. Because whatever you think it is, probably isn't it, really. <laughs> it's just a, an intuitive sense of what, what it must be. And then, if at that time you can stabilise yourself with just having confidence, then you will be drawn. You'll be drawn by the power of the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas to whatever situation is going to be conducive for your further advancing on the path. So some kind of trust that that's going to happen and is happening and then, you know, all your friends and family who know what you what you believe they're going to be saying and thinking and practicing and doing things that will support you in that. And then you'll feel pleased. You'll think, Oh, this is this is working and, you know, probably go unconscious again next time. You've been born of something else. Or maybe you've gone straight to the uh, pure land of Sukhavati. I mean, we don't tend to talk too much about that in the West because it sounds too much like, you know, Christian heaven. It's like, well, hang on, I could have stayed a Christian and been born in heaven. <laughs> what's, 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 why have I gone to all this trouble to become a Buddhist? <laughs> Yes, you know, gradually it might creep up on you. <laughs> Actually, I do have faith I can be born in the land of Sukhavati. It doesn't really matter, because even if you're born in the land of Sukhavati, you still come back to this world and have to carry on the path sooner or later. So, sooner or later. I, I know somebody who was always saying, I don't want to be born in the land of Sukhavati. I want to come back to this oh. world and help. Don't worry, if you go to Sukhavati, you'll be able to get anything you wish for. So, if you want to come back to this world to help, you'll be here. 
Well, we're not always very careful what we wish for, are we? So I'm not quite sure what happens in Sukhavati. <laughs> But you need to notice in yourself, you may find that you do have some kind of what you'd say is a, a some kind of pattern, habitual pattern is reawakened when you hear about Amitabha and the pure land of Amitabha, the Sukhavati, and you just know, just know that's what you want. So that's great. Just keep that in mind. And if that isn't, doesn't really sort of strike home, just think what does. What for me is what I, you know, brings me that sense of confidence. And that's certainly for me the idea, I've taken refuge in the Buddha. And particularly for me, I, I think of uh, Kempa Rinpoche, because I have this very strong connection with Kempa Rinpoche. And I feel he's going to look after me, it'll be all right. Mm -hmm. you know, he's, he can't, he's not confined to any particular place or time. So wherever I am when I die, he'll be there. And he'll be laughing at me. <laughs> <laughs> You've forgotten again, haven't you? <laughs> it's all appearance emptiness, sound emptiness, bliss emptiness, awareness emptiness. Remember, <laughs> go on, sing, dance. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> Every time you see him, he always delivers the same message very strongly. So you. I think to myself, well, when I see him in the Bardos, I know what he's going to be saying. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it's important to think about that. I don't know if that helps. You, presumably you've looked at, there's more to dying than death. Wherever this question came from. Um, Have you? Not yet, no. Oh, yeah, it's because, book, yeah, that, that um, has lots of suggestions for everybody, whether you're approaching death yourself or somebody else's or, you know, whatever. Okay, what is the relationship between embodiment and awareness? Very interesting question. It goes with someone else's question. Why is it the centering oneself in the body seems to allow awareness to expand? really interesting, isn't it? Because, okay, we've just been talking about this body as impermanent, not really there, illusory, and kind of, when we part company with it, it doesn't matter, we just let it go. So, is, is it something to be thought of as, you know, not to be attached to? Or is it something that's actually got some kind of real meaning to it. And I think that's a really, really important question. Goes with um, Chamba's question yesterday about, well, what is it that we've, you know, what is that reality that we've mistaken for something that it isn't? And I've said, sort of just in passing really, well, it's talked of in terms of the um, the kayas, the three kayas of the Buddha and the five wisdoms. But the when you track back what those things are referring to, you realise you're talking about everything that's manifesting in the world is actually. <coughs> emanating from something that's real in the Dhammata. So that goes back to that song of Nilarepa. It's some, some configuration of, that's there in the Dhammata, which is then <coughs> manifesting as this world, and then we're overlaying it with our own confusion. So that when we let go of our confusion, we see what's manifesting, we see it, more as it truly is, but to truly know what it is, in a sense, you have to become one with the Dhammata, and then you, you, you've kind of reached the essence of where it's all emanating from. So that means also our, our body, our body and our environment, or you could say our 
sometimes it's equated with the kaya, so that the uh, our heart and mind is the dharma kaya, and then our expression through, through speech, it's usually expressed as speech or, or the, the prana of our body, is then the samoga kaya, and then the world we live in is the nimanakaya, so our body and the world is the nimanakaya. But what does that mean in practice? It means that we can become aware in our own experience of the three kayas in ourselves, as it were. We can become aware of our nimanakaya, which you could say was our real body, and we can become aware of our sambhogakaya, which is our expression, and we can become aware of our dhammakaya nature from which it's all emanating, which is our own. We, we sense that in our own heart, or that's just putting it very simply. I mean, it's, it's through the whole body, really. It's kind of... It goes very deep, this, actually. We, t- we tend to think of our body as a sort of cardboard cut-up thing that could be removed from the world. But in actual fact, it's we're completely integrated and interpenetrating with everything, with each other. It's, it's all very different from how we... We've projected it. That's why we know there's others. I mean, how do we know there's others? Interesting, isn't it? I, you, you can't actually prove there's others. Anything that you could say about others impacting on us, you could say, well, that's just your own mind. That's it. It's just you. How do you know it's actually other? You know, you say, well, yes, it's non-dual. You say, oh, yeah. But if it's non-dual, is it all me? You know, how, do I, how, how is there any play between, or communication, or between self and other? Very really interesting question, isn't it? If it's all non-dual, we're all one big splotch. <laughs> <laughs> but, but actually, we're, we're, we're all interacting, and we can, we, we, we kind of... Uh, um, it's some kind of that's the most important and alive aspect of the whole of reality, isn't it? The in, the interface between self and other 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 beings, the intimacy of that, and the joy of that, and the. But what is it? Because I can't even find me, let alone anyone else. And yet, <coughs> when I'm mindful and aware, and just very simple, I can relate to others. It's interesting, it doesn't mention that in the Satipatthana, does it? You know, you, but it does say inside and outside. Mm. And I wonder if that's I mean, internally and externally. Internally and externally, yeah. Yeah, is that actually externally being aware of another being or another being being aware of me? I, I'm not sure. I wanted to look at the commentary more, what that's about. Mm. But it seems to suggest something like that. So then that means... You know, our body is something very, you know, it's, it's something wonderful. And what happens is when we have this idea that it's, you know, just this thing that's not very important, it's just lump that is kind of doesn't always do what I want, you know, kind of not quite aggressive, <coughs> aggressive towards one's body. One's, one's made a kind of false separation that, and therefore one's, disintegrated, not integrated, and therefore you're, there's something very um, unbalanced. So that coming back into, okay, you still think of it as your solid body, in a quite a coarse way maybe, but at least you are including it in. So you're actually integrating, in, you're much more integrated into reality than you were when you had separated it out so much. So coming back into the body is coming closer to reality. Then as you as you connect more to it and you realise that it's not as you think it is, that because you've brought the energy all into much more integrated way, you get the the um, yeah, it's almost like the smooth running of how things naturally run smoothly when we haven't interfered with it, with our ignorant clinging to things. 
it has a natural way of flowing, a natural kind of interpenetrating and interconnected sense of the whole of reality, really. And you notice it straight away, because when you come back into your body, you can, you can move and respond far more effectively without even thinking about it. Whereas when you've gone into your head and you're, seeing, you're ignoring your body, you're much more clumsy, you're more likely to, to act in, a, in an aggressive and, and um, harmful way without even meaning to. Whereas once you're you know, in Tai Chi and those kind of disciplines, you, you play with that, you kind of come back into the body, you, get, you allow yourself to feel grounded and connected. Everything's connected and then you don't have to think you know how to move, you know how to avoid, how to balance things. So in a way, your sati, the balancing factor, and the body become sort of one, one reality, as it were. It's not your conceptualised body, it's your lived-in body. So that's why we talk about being embodied, embodying our values, embodying our... our true nature or whatever it is, whatever we truly are or whatever we're feeling or whatever whatever's happening for us, if we embody it in an integrated way, we're much closer to the, the natural reality, the dhammata actually, we're, we're closer to dhammata and things, you know, those connections that are, that are there can manifest much more easily, far less complicated. So there's a reason why when we master something, we stop thinking about it, don't we? You, first of all, you have to work <coughs> at it, you, you develop the skills, and then when you've mastered it, it's just natural. And so often we say, oh, really, it comes from the heart. Oh, it doesn't come from the heart, it's just technique. We say that sometimes about music or dancing or whatever. It doesn't, it doesn't really come from the heart. And then somebody has that quality that kind of really hits you, and it comes from their heart because it's totally integrated with, without thought. So it's good to master things and you, can, you get that sense of that, oh yeah, that's, that's what mastery is. It's, it's beyond thought. It's the you know, same with our lives. We, mindfulness <coughs> isn't having to remember in the sense of think about it. Mindfulness is in the, in the sense of you've become totally integrated and you're, you're naturally connected with what's going on around you and you're responding to it effort, even you could say effortlessly because it's the alive edge of your experience you're just responding but that means you have to really bring yourself back again and again into well, I mean, what are you doing? you can't conceptualise it I think that's why it's so interesting in the Satipatthana, it says the minimum, the absolute minimum of conceptual understanding of what it is that you're aware of, just enough. So I can be aware of the body just enough so that I'm integrated, but not so much that I'm now over-analyzing it and getting too conceptual about it. It's interesting, isn't it? Mm. So then this, why is it that when you centre, is it, yeah, does it expand? So awareness expands in the sense that it's more integrated. Everything becomes an integrated whole. Whereas when you're up here and your body is being sort of abused, as it were, your, your attention is sort of sucked into trying to hold it all together because it's not holding together very well naturally because you've interfered with it too much. But then as you stop interfering and you just find that natural balance in yourself, then everything opens up naturally and integrates naturally. So there is a reason. Well, no, it's certainly I... For a long time, as a Buddhist, I had this idea that my, I should neglect my body, you know, because my body was impermanent and 
not important and that it was the mind that was important and and I was encouraged in that I think to a large extent you know you don't need to take any notice of your body you can ignore it it wasn't really what I was being taught but it was the part of what I was being taught that I picked up on and it was quite a surprise to me that actually the body was important I thought of you know Alan described it as you know this big sack of potatoes mm -hmm. that gets in the way a bit and I thought yeah that's how I think of my body mm -hmm. whereas you know like he helped me a lot with he's a Tai Chi teacher and he was combining the Tai Chi teaching with the um, his Dharma teaching and I found that quite a revelation that the body was actually integral to the whole thing there's no part of your experience that you can hive off and say well you know that's to be dismissed which is what sati is all about really so the message that the body doesn't matter is when you're um, attached to the body and you're you're so fascinated with the body that you're distracted from even seeking the path to awakening <coughs> so then to to give up any concern, any worldly concern, this was, this was my idea, you know, give up all worldly concerns. Yes, if you're thinking of your body in a worldly way, yes, give up that. But what is it really in itself? Don't give that up. You know, that's what you're trying to discover. There's subtle points that get lost, certainly on me. Okay. So what does it mean to be shaken in this context? That was the context of the Buddha. I think we talked about that yesterday. Was there more that people wanted to ask on that? The Buddha is not shaken, not disturbed. I think it was something to do with... Um, if It was linked to one of the other questions. If you've got that kind of... You know, if you're feeling a, a strong emotion... Mm. Yeah, not shaken by it, so we, we weren't mm. Mm. quite sure yeah. what that... Mm. Yes, yeah, so it was, it was kind of asking maybe if you said what you said in there. I, I suppose it's like you remain centred. So you, you remain resourced <coughs> and centred and you're responding in a very direct and connected way even though actually the emotion is very strong whereas what tends to happen is when you have a strong emotion there's another part of us that's not integrated that's saying no or oh you know this is a big threat or this shouldn't be so there's some part of you that's trying to kind of get get away from it and then that's when it gets very complicated and disturbing your whole system gets disturbed. Your whole mind-body system gets, you know, the energy system, everything gets completely disturbed. And it's very difficult to think clearly. It's very difficult to um, function properly. But if you can not separate off from it and simply almost, you know, you, you meet it and almost... I hesitate to say enjoy it, but I think it is, must be close to enjoying the, the intensity of it. Your responses are, you know, your, your system isn't disturbed, and your responses are, you know, just as I've been describing it, that there's, there's a natural way to respond to that, that, that you do respond in that way, and it's, it's naturally skillful and you're not disturbed. You know, it doesn't. Nothing's getting in the way of that natural response. So that, mm. you know, okay. You're feeling the pain of, you know, the wrench really of being separated from people who are essential, or you know, not essential but integral to your world. Really, they've they've been sort of pulled away, leaving you in a completely different space and totally raw and kind of like. But what do I do in this space? But you're, you, you can just be in that state. And 
there's nothing disinte- it's not it's, it's integrated it's, it's it's a whole and from that comes kind of some kind of inspiration and in the case of the buddha it's inspiration to say how amazing that the tathagata is not shaken by that which you know i'm still talking about today two and a half thousand years later in amazement there's something that's actually you know it's, it's informing me that such a thing is possible I was just wondering, sometimes if, if you imagine when there's been something where your child's really getting hurt, or you, you imagine the sort of mother pushing her baby out of the way of the lorry, it's almost that they go into that state and they're feeling that huge fear and they just do what needs they to be They do, done. that's so right. Kind of like, that's do it. Because of their connection with the child, they just kind of <coughs> feel what they have to do and they do it. It's amazing what people do. Yeah, with total terror of the lorry, but just... Yeah, like I heard somebody... When they saw a lorry, a big heavy lorry falling on somebody, they actually were able to <coughs> lift it off them, which actually afterwards was impossible. You've heard of things like that? I've heard of things like that. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Makes me go all tingly when I think of that. But they must, have, they must have been so connected to the situation that they just completely became one with it. I'm sure that, that no thought at all. And that comes from, you know, they didn't have to start, start thinking, oh, I better, be, I better feel a bit of compassion for this person, what should I do? They just yeah. went bang, because they already had the compassion. Yeah, it's amazing, isn't it? What we're capable of, or what we will be capable of, as time goes on. And practice. What it what is happening when our experience of awareness seems to be confined? It's interesting, isn't it? How can that be? How can that be? Like when I think of space, a vast space. It's like not. Almost immediately I feel it's confined because somehow I've made my initial... I mean, obviously I've got some intuition of endless space because I'm saying it and I'm, I'm, you know, I'm mindful of it. I'm mindful of endless space. But actually, when I look, I've already turned it into a confined space. It's already got a fuzzy edge around it. Now, however far away it goes, there's always this fuzzy edge. So I think, what is that? I know that isn't space. I know I don't need to have that, and it isn't helping me. But it still comes up. That's the confined, isn't it? And that can get very tight. Like, for example, if you get upset with someone... And you try to then, you know, open out and feel space. It keeps coming back <laughs> into, yes, but, <laughs> yes, but. You can't see my way out of it somehow. But what is that? What is it that seems to be so hard and so, so powerful in shaping my reality? What is it? It can't be other than my own, you know, what... The creative power of, of my own mind. I mean, what else can it be? And yet, how am I doing it? How's that happening? It's astonishing. So I don't know what's happening. <laughs> I'm still hoping to find out. <laughs> I'm still hoping to find out. You know, I, I find ways of it not happening so much, but I don't know how it happens. I mean, the, the the Buddhist sort of line on this is that it's um, habits from past, you know, habits that we've established in the past. But that doesn't really answer anything. I mean, what is a, what is a habit? How does it come from one life to another? I mean, what sort of thing is it? I'm still wondering. Yeah. If it's all being conditioned by my past habits... How's that possible? What kind of thing? 
could come from my past into the present and then condition me and make that happen when I don't want it to happen. It's part of the, the whole the mystery of the whole thing, really. What, what do we mean by causes and conditions? You know, it's easy to say, oh, well, it's all conditioned, it's all interdependence, it's all, you know, things. One thing conditions another. And it, yeah, but what are the conditions? You know, what kind of thing is a condition? And you think, oh, well, you know, we're here today because of all the conditions that have led to this happening, you know, uh, everything that's happened in all our lives, all this life, in the last, you know, few months or weeks or whatever, and we've all, we've all come <coughs> together. So this situation now is a reflection of all those different conditions. But where are they? I mean, if they were in the past, they couldn't be conditioning the present, could they? If you see what I mean, they, they, the past is gone, so that they can't be conditioning. So it has to be conditions of the present. But how are they? What are they? I think. Oh, this must be what they mean by dhammatani dhammas. Mm -hmm. Something you don't know and you can't, you can't conceptualize. But you can have a sort of, you, you can think about it and think, oh, well, there must have been these conditions. You know, you must have, you know, you must have seen this course advertised somewhere or you must have been motivated because something happened to you in the past, you know, in your life. And so you could trace them back sort of mentally, sort of as a story. <coughs> but actually what they are and how they're, Functioning is an amazing mystery, and this is, in the, you know, the, the Buddhist tradition says, well, the answer to that is only Buddhas know, and Buddhas are, you know, they they are. They sometimes say they are omniscient; they know everything. I think what that's saying is that that they're the totality of. They are the totality itself, which is all knowledge. It's based on totality, and they are t totalities. Therefore, all knowledge actually emanates from them, if you like, or is them. Sort of. But you know, now you're getting very um, far. I suppose you might call it metaphysics, wouldn't you? Kind of, what is it all, and what is what is all this? Which I think is helpful. I think it's a bit of a pointer. It opens up. It opens up our minds to something, even though we can't. In, in another sense, it doesn't tell us anything. But it, it, it's uplifting. I find it. I find it does tell me something because something inside me responds to that as yes. That's that's the right. Direction. There's something there that's, that's up uplifting and taking me in the direction I want to go. But there's no doubt it's a mystery. It's a mystery in the sense of whatever it is, I'm never going to be able to grasp it. Mm. I'm never going to be able to turn it into something else that will reflect it to me. I'm only ever going to know it because I am it. So hasten the day. <laughs> yeah. So that's my best shot at an answer to that. Um, why is it that? Oh, I've done that. Good. We're, we're getting through them. Um, okay. So then, um, did we look at this one? What about? Oh no, we did that one. How do you experience suffering without suffering? Did we talk about that? I mean, did I talk about it? A bit, here and there, because the other questions are similar, aren't they? What is the role of confidence or faith here? The problem with this, how do you experience suffering, is what I was talking about, isn't it? You might argue that it isn't suffering if you're not suffering. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's yeah. I mean, it's got to be a little bit flexible with how we use words there. 
the role of confidence and faith. Maybe I have spoken about that a bit in relationship to death. It would be the same with things in life. And how do we experience the pain, anger, emotion without being shaken by it? So maybe perhaps I've touched on that. And what is equanimity really? Is it more than noticing our emotions and sitting with them? And what are the next steps towards complete equanimity? (laughs) (laughs) What is it really? Equanimity. Because it's the last of the Bhajangas. Mm. You know, you start with mindfulness, investigation, joy, tranquility, samadhi, and then, and then equanimity. Equalness is what Rinpoche is always singing about. Equalness, equalness. It's all equal, equal. And it's not a dulling down. You know, you can have a sort of indifference where you've dulled, dulled out completely. So yes, you're treating everything equally, but in a dulled out way. <laughs> so that's obviously not a state of mind that we're aspiring to. I think it, you can only really understand equanimity when you've understood the true nature of reality and realised it's all, whatever it is, it's all emanating from the dharmakaya or dhammata or whatever you, you want to call it. So it's all equally an expression of that. So this is why Rinpoche is singing all the time about appearance emptiness, sound emptiness, bliss emptiness, um, Awareness itself, emptiness, rigpa itself, vidya, yeah, emptiness. And therefore, everything's equal. And they're all equal expressions of the nature of reality, and therefore, equally bliss, actually, equally perfect, equally, yeah, the opposite of unsatisfactory. This is the great Mahamudra or the great perfection, Zogchen, that everything is actually completely perfect as it is, doesn't need any altering. But you can only appreciate that from the perspective of understanding the true nature without any overlay from the mind that is interpreting and clinging and holding and creating she like creating images of itself. It's like... So we can't expect to practice equanimity just like that. But even at where we are now, we can recognise where we're reacting and realise that those reactions are completely the wrong direction. So that to, instead of reacting we're moving more towards responding. So you're responding to situations with equanimity. (coughs) So equanimity is a way of meeting situations. I guess it's a bit what they're trying to get at, I think, when they say non-judgmentally. When you're judging, you're, you're reacting. You've got a prejudice, you've got an idea already. When you're practicing equanimity you are opening to the situation and you're allowing it to touch you so that you can respond to it in an alive way. And we can all do that to some extent. We can all do it better than we tend to habitually do it. Even though that's not ultimate equanimity. And the other way that you can start thinking about equanimity is equalising your uh, response to people. So we tend to have... a you know, people we love very easily. We've got a very loving relationship with and we love them very easily. And then there's people who we don't have such an easy relationship with and then some that we are really quite hostile towards. And you can kind of stir up your own reactivity by deliberately practicing, you know, practicing love and compassion towards all beings equally. 
I find that merely stirs up my negativity, mm -hmm. which I think it has to be the point. <laughs> <laughs> But I might think that I love everybody equally and then I think of a certain person mm -hmm. and I realise that it's not so easy. You know, often it's people, people I read about in the newspaper or, you know, who've done something that you feel you, you can't understand at all and you, you just want to not have to think that such a person exists. And they think, oh, now there's a chance. You know, how can I have the same sense of love towards such a person as I do towards somebody very dear to me. And, and I realise it seems impossible. I think, oh, so then I'm really holding on to that. Although I say, oh, you know, all beings, I want to save all beings, I want to bring all beings to enlightenment. But in reality, you look at my mind, you know, the difference. I think, oh, there's something to work on there. How how can that, you know, what is it that I'm I'm, I'm holding that, that's stopping a natural response? So then it gives me something to work on a bit and to soften up and to find ways of appreciating that all beings are, in fact. What else could they be other than expressions of the true nature of, in, of reality and enlightenment? And so something in me is actually blocking that off. So it, it helps me to own things that I might not have noticed otherwise by trying to have equal love for all beings. And noticing, oh yeah, that's an accomplishment. Buddhas have equal love for all beings. I'm working on it. <laughs> you know, there's, it's, I find it quite sobering doing those kind of practices. But yes, I think that's where you start. So to have equal love for yourself and all beings. You might have to start with not having a very negative and hostile attitude towards yourself, which quite a lot of people do. They judge themselves very harshly. They spend a lot of their time thinking about, you yeah. know, Not being very kind to themselves, actually. Just having one part of themselves attacking another part of themselves. Well, okay, that's a good place to start practicing equanimity. To teach the two parts of yourself to, to love each other. Come on, be friends. <laughs> Not this, <coughs> this squabbling. You, know, you should be doing better. No, no. You don't need to talk to me like that. You, should, you shouldn't speak to me like that. <laughs> Play nicely. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, so and everything we do in Dharma is about yes, and another step towards complete equanimity. So it's a very amazing, quite amazing, that kind of enlightened equanimity. Equal love for all beings. Because in Shri says sometimes it's if you're on the receiving end, it might feel a bit insulting. You know, that's you, you go to see this person and they they greet you as, as they really love you and you feel oh you know I'm really special, and then some rubbish person comes <laughs> after you and they're treating them the same. <laughs> so are you my friend or not? Are you their friend? <laughs> it's funny, isn't it? We can feel like that. Why should, it, why should it diminish how much they love me if they love somebody else the same amount? Sibling love rival. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> There's only so much love in the world. You've given it all to them. <laughs> it's really not like that. So how does love allow and equanimity go together? Love allow equanimity. And then there's a suggestion, I think. Love is allowing things to be here. I think it's more than that, though, isn't it? Yeah, that's, I, mean, that's, I was trying to ask how you saw it, like, how hmm? they go together. Yeah. yeah. Certainly, 
there's an element of allowing in love, isn't there? Mm. You know, that you're, you're, there's this kind of space opens up where the other person is, can be really present. You can allow them to be completely present. But then the love is more than that. It's, the love is really the joy that you get in the presence of somebody. It's, that's when you feel loved, isn't it? When you feel the other person is really enjoying, getting some joy from your presence. You feel, oh, oh, that's nice, you know. Like when I, when I do that, they smile and they laugh and they, they look happy. They, they're pleased to see me, you know. So my presence is actually giving them pleasure. And that's when you feel loved. But it's more than just allowing. You do, you know, it's possible, isn't it? Even somebody who's, you know, you'd think doesn't have much going for them, if somebody could actually be pleased to see them, I'm sure they would respond. Such a sense of relief. If somebody's actually pleased to see me, they actually can see some part of me that they're pleased to see. This, this idea that that's how we should... We should meet people, we should look for that part that we're pleased to see and just look at that. There always is a part of them that we're pleased to see. And then we just look at that and we just be pleased about that part. And of course that will bring out the best in them, won't it? It always does. I'm always much nicer to people who are pleased to see me. <laughs> as soon as I sense they're not pleased to see me, then I'm not so nice to see. <laughs> yeah. I don't know, is that enough? Yeah, that's really lovely, because I was thinking about parts of me, I'm, you know, to right. tell them, and that love just so lovely. I thought, I also need to be a little bit pleased to see them. Yeah, there's here. something about them you're pleased yeah. to see, yeah. So just, just really more, even more... Yes. Yeah, cool. Thank you. So could you say more about joy and death and your experience of reflecting on death in this way? Maybe I have said that. Mm -hmm. yeah. It just helps me get a good sense of proportion. You know, when, when things, you know, getting maybe a bit wound up about something, thinking about death is like, just, it's like sanity. You know, I can't. I, I can I get a much better sense of proportion when I think of death. Okay, it's not it's not that Yeah. I might be dead. <coughs> so what would it matter? And then okay, but I'm not dead, so it has a certain importance. But not it's more in proportion somehow. To do its real importance. Because there's two ways of thinking about death. One is that it's the end of now, isn't it? It's the end of this life. And then there's also kind of worry about how uncomfortable it might be. And I, I find those are two categories for me. Like thinking of it giving a, the, the meaning of my life in, in the light of death. It's, it's like one way that I feel joyful about. And then when I think about that it might be painful, I think, gosh, you know, I need to shape up. I, I, I don't even like just having a little bit of a stomach ache, you know. I already think, oh, well, I can't really meditate now because I've got a stomach ache. I better go to bed, you know, have, have a pill or something. I think, oh, you know, what are you going to do when you're faced with some real painful situation that goes on and on and on and on? Or, you know, I think... I'd better shape up if I'm if I'm going to enjoy that. <laughs> it motivates me very much to understand really how can it be that you can suffer great pain and and actually not be pulled down by it and it, you know somehow that that actually help your practice or bring you to enlightenment or even you can enjoy it as you know great yogins can enjoy great pain because it's kind of intensifies their realisation of emptiness. I think, oh, hasten the day, I want to get to that point because otherwise I'm going to have to suffer. 
which you know, I'm not looking forward to. I don't feel joyful about that. <laughs> well, I'm going to have to just put up with it, aren't I? Yeah. Who knows what I'm going to end up having to put up with it. And just make pranidhanas and hope that I will learn from it, whatever it is. So I don't know if that's helpful. <laughs> uh, how do you can reconnect or realign with the indestructible heart essence when you've been through a major trauma or upset? How do you find your inspiration again? Inspiration. How do you find your inspiration? So it's talking about when you completely knocked off balance, maybe. You can't find your way back. I think it's very important not to panic. You know, just to think, okay, this is something that I'm going through. Inspiration does come back. But it's important not to try and force it. I think you need to kind of notice where it comes back naturally. And just focus on those things rather than thinking, well, I should be inspired by this, I should be inspired by that. I think you've got to really look what does inspire me. You know, like it may be something that you think shouldn't really inspire me. You know, I should be inspired by Dharma, but actually I'm inspired by music. I think you've got to go with that. You know, you've got to go with the music. Something that, you know, I'm not inspired by meditating, but I am inspired by playing with children. You know, whatever it is that that brings you to life again, I think you've just got to to go for that and gradually you'll find it's because what's happened is the shock has stopped the prana flowing properly. You know, they stopped the energy. You're dis in a way you're disintegrated, you're not integrated because something has actually knocked you so strongly. So that you've got to the whole body mind the whole integrated whole has to get moving again. It's the same with things. It's name like depression or shock or any anything that's very disturbing. You have to get the energy moving again. So you just find a way that helps it move again. You know, often nature helps. People find nature helps, and uh, I think the elements help as well. Like the raw elements, fire or water, wind. Or of storms, sort of things that really get your get you moving again, and I think just accept that that's that's the level that that's where you are, and you're just waiting for the inspiration to come back, and it will come back. It does naturally, but not to be hard on yourself and sort of force yourself to do practices that you think you should be doing. That is very likely to make it worse, and then you're likely to react and uh, sort of think, give up, give it all up. It's very important not to think to yourself, well, I've practised all these years and look at me, now it's, I'm just completely hopeless because look, as soon as anything bad happens, look at what a mess I am. It's really, don't think like that. Don't think like that. It's not, it's not at all surprising that we get knocked off, knocked out of, knocked off balance. It just shows we're going to have to keep practicing for a long time, and we knew that anyway, because you look at the lives of the great practitioners of the past, they did practice for a very long time. So I'm not going to be any different. And, you know, even great practitioners can get knocked off sometimes, not, you know, knocked off, off balance. So don't be put off by that. It just happens sometimes. You know, sometimes it's for a long time. But still, there's still something there. You foster whatever is there, whatever inspiration is still there. Just keep fostering that and it'll come back. Practicing sati in this very light way, getting the light touch. So don't do, don't do practices in a very heavy way. Do them in a very light way. Sometimes you can do a practice with other people and they're practicing it and you're just there for the ride. It's quite good, actually. Sometimes you... <laughs> Oh, I'm just here for the ride. 
so you're enjoying it and you're rejoicing in the fact they're doing it and of course you know this is very nice Buddhist, Buddhist teaching that when you rejoice in the good done by others you make the same amount of punya yourself Mm. So this is, you know, chief easy punya. A <laughs> 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 uh, friend who decided to make that his main practice. It was very nice. It was very nice having him around because whenever you were doing anything, he'd come and look at what you're doing and say, "Oh, I'm really happy you're doing that." <laughs> 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 anyway, that's my best shot of that. Could you say more about the intuitive balancing power of sati? Or maybe it's time for your discussion, isn't it? Mm. Yes, I hope. The session was due to end at quarter past eleven for a half hour break and a discussion, but it's all flexible. We can do yeah. whatever. Well, I th- I'd like you to have a discussion. I'd like you to have a discussion where you talk about what you've you picked up from this weekend what's um, helped or inspired you in some way and how you now want to take that forward and just share that with each other. It doesn't have to be a big thing, it can just be something to kind of consolidate, you know, reflect back on what you've been what you've been taking in and how you're going to apply that. So it's a reflection for everybody and also a chance to share that with each other which I think you might find is um, a good way to spend your time you can then all rejoice in each other's Mm. (laughs) well it might be that actually somebody wants to talk about something that's not so positive and that's a chance then for everybody to listen to that without um, sort of jumping on them (laughs) <laughs> What's the matter with you? Yeah. Just to, you know, practice equalness and equanimity and non judgmental and whatever it is that you've picked up and how you want to take that forward. And anything you want to for me to carry forth from further or you want me to talk about more. And if I get some questions, I can deal with them this afternoon. And if I don't, I'll have to think of something else. <laughs> yes, that's what we could do.